You're listening to The Gutsy Podcast, where we talk about all things real, raw, and ridiculous about running a business authentically. Whether you need an inspirational pick-me-up or a swift kick in the mental ass, The Gutsy Podcast is your bi-weekly guide to getting out of your head and back into action. I'm Laura Ora, branding and mindset coach for female entrepreneurs, CEO of Works & Co., and your host on this journey through entrepreneurship. It's time to fuel your gutsy. You have a growing business and it's time to add people. Okay, here we go. (laughs) How in the hell do you do that? Where do you even begin? Should you hire an employee? Should you bring in a subcontractor? Like seriously, what are the first steps? Hiring and managing a team requires diligent steps and brand alignment. So today we're going to talk about how to find and manage your employees, subcontractors, and service providers. And to do that, I have Laura Tolhook from Essential HR. As a certified human resource leader, Laura knows that when a business faces HR problems, there is no room for ambiguity, only positive results. For the last 15 years, she has blended sound HR practices with her pragmatic approach to improve business performance. Now, Laura leads a team of HR professionals as they navigate complex HR situations with managers, help guide decisions, and instill confidence with actionable steps. I'm super excited to have you on with me today. Laura, welcome to the Gutsy Podcast. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on. Oh, yeah. And I may I just say that two Lauras make a right. Like, this has to be good. Laura squared. <laughs> Laura squared. I love it. So tell me a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. Like, what led you up to where you are today? Sure. So I came up in a entrepreneurial home. Uh, my dad had a small business. And so it was always kind of in my blood and I was always intrigued by, well, sometimes I was really upset about the tenacity and hard work it takes to run a small business, but <laughs> True story. growing up now, I, I see the tenacity and really the, the gumption that he had to continue the business over so many years. And so when I started my journey into, you know, the, the corporate world, the, what are you going to do when you grow up? Uh, I knew I wanted to work with people and I wanted to work in business. So HR was a natural, a natural step for me. So I was in the corporate world for, uh, you know, 15 years. And then when my, when I was pregnant with my second child, um, well, actually after I had my second child, I thought, you know what, I want flexibility. Uh, I want to be able to balance my life in a way that's right for me. And if I'm going to be working 60 hours a week, which I don't want to be working 60 hours a week, uh, I might as well be for myself. And so while I was on maternity leave, I took up a website name and I built a business plan and I went full throttle at it. So that's kind of where it started. And the whole idea was really to build a part-time job for me. That was the extent of what I needed and what I was happy with. Um, But what I learned is that there's a lot of fantastic small businesses who don't have the capacity to bring on an HR person full-time in their company, but who really, really appreciated the help of an HR professional. And so the business grew um, and I found myself back in the position of, wait, why am I working all these hours again? This Uh wasn't the point. And so I started hiring a team. And it's kind of funny because I I felt like that decision, um, I guess it could be best summed up as I was the HR person who was scared to hire. Oh, uh, that, that's an interesting approach. The cobbler's children have no shoes. Yes. That whole idea. I uh, feel you. So I started by subcontracting and then, um, and then we started bringing on team members. But my business is all about being flexible with employers and with small businesses um, who are our clients. So I know they want flexibility from us. And it really ran right into who essential HR is as an employer as well. So I actually only hire part-time people uh, and not part-time people who want to be full-time, but professional, passionate rock stars in the HR world who said, you know what? I'm fantastic at my job um, and I don't want the nine to five. And those are the people who we build our team with. Uh, So individuals who are just looking for that balance, but who are such fantastic HR practitioners. So that's kind of where we're at, we, where we are now. 
Wow, that's amazing. So I can completely relate. And, you know, I started my business when I was six and a half months pregnant with my son. So there must be something in that like pregnancy water or hormone <laughs> <laughs> that gives you the extra gutsy to to make that bold move. Um, you know, as, especially as like professional females, you know, like there was, and I'd be curious if how you felt about this too. Like I, I knew that I wanted to be an amazing mom. Like I wanted to be there for my son, but I didn't want to give up, give up my career and my passion either because that's such a huge part of who I am. So, you know, it just kind of seemed like a natural next step to open up a business. Yeah. I mean, I begged for part-time employment at my job before I, before I started the business um, and they just didn't think it was possible. And so I said, well, you know what? I can do this on my own. I, I, I've got some background. I've got some people who I can talk to. And it is amazing that when you step out, it's like, you know, whether it's you believe in God or whether you believe it's the universe, it literally provides the path in front of you. I don't think I met so many incredible women as in the first year of my business who I felt like I was the little baby in the nest. And they literally came in, brought me the food, lifted me up, taught me how to fly. Just people that I never would have met otherwise um, and from the most random locations. And so I decided, you know, that's who I want to be and that's who I want to surround myself with in the business. You know, that support team when, when you start particularly, I mean, you need that team, you know, different versions of that team throughout your career. But um, when you start that business, having those people that, you know, pick you up when you're feeling down or guide you down a path or, you know, just really are there to love and support on you because it's new, right? And and I love and respect so much. And I think our listeners are really going to appreciate that, you know, you just kind of stepped out on a limb too, like the rest of us, you know, like I've never done this before, but I can figure it out, right? Like I'm a smart yeah. woman. I can figure it out. Yeah. QuickBooks what? Marketing yeah. from what? <laughs> Wait, no, I can create you at a great employer brand, but what is all this other stuff that came with it? Yes. And that's a really good reminder that you don't have to know all the answers to do it. Like if you wait until you know all of these systems and processes and programs and everything and like, okay, now I'm ready to start the business. Look, girl, it is not going to happen. <laughs> it is not going to happen. You you grow and learn by doing. Well, I think if, you know, I just think of my website alone and that was the first thing I invested in. I wanted, you know, a, a strong website and a strong brand. And I think I've redone it two times, like in the last two years, because you evolve and you, you learn new facets of yourself and new facets of your business and new facets of who you are. And that evolving process, I think is almost the best part. I mean, that's when you're really coming into who you are, right? Because when you're, when you're first starting out and first of all, I love, I love you for investing in your brand first. (laughs) Like that is so, so, so important, but you know, also having that mindset that being flexible and knowing that this, you know, this could change and evolve six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now. So, you know, just really having that mindset that you're learning who you are as a business owner and, and that's okay. Yep. Yeah. And I think I'm one of the best pieces of advice I got when I was first starting out is, um, from a mentor that was set up with my business account actually. Uh, and he said, he's like, so what is it that you do? And I was like, Oh, well I do a, and I do B and I do succession planning and then we do hiring and we do health and safety and we do <laughs> And he's like, do you want to do health and safety? I was like, well, I can do health and safety. He's like, what do you want to do? Uh, And he really made me focus on the things that I loved and that I was passionate about versus trying to be everything to all people. Yes. It is so easy to get wrapped up in the I should dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Just because either your competitors are doing it or that's what the industry tells you to, that's what you should do. Or, you know, you spend 80 hours on Google in the middle of the night. Like <laughs> you don't have to be everything to everyone. And as a matter yeah. of fact, you shouldn't be. You started evaluating your website against everybody else's in your industry and you decided, you know, yeah. that was the last time. I mean, I've done that a few times where you just go down that rabbit hole and you're like, no, this is who I am. And we will attract the individuals who want to work with us because we're fantastic. And we're not A, B, or C, but we are who we are. See, I love, because we are fantastic. You're damn right you are. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and this kind of leads into something that you said earlier is you realized that you were working like a boatload of hours again. Like, wait a second. 
I didn't start this business to continue like driving my health into the ground. Yeah. Well, what was that moment like for you or that realization? And how did you start to reclaim some of that time back? So it's funny because it still creeps up. And it came because I was getting leads and I wouldn't follow up. Or I would even be scared to market. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put myself out there. I didn't want to let anybody know what I was doing because not even that I had too much work at the time, but I didn't have the capacity to take on more. And so I just stopped marketing and I stopped hoping and I stopped, you know, looking at the future because I was scared of potential new work coming in. Not that it was coming in, but I was scared that it potentially might. Uh. And I thought, this isn't a way to run a business. <laughs> like, why, why haven't I followed up with that warm lead? Why haven't I done A, B, or C? And I was like, there's a block here. And it's, it's a fear out of a capacity issue. And that I can't produce what I promised I'd be producing in the amount of time that is, you know, the right amount of time to get it done. Uh, and I said, okay, something has to change. Um, so I actually brought on three subcontractors. Uh, to do some work. They all had capacities in different areas. And it just kind of blossomed from there. One individual, she, you know, this was a side hustle for her, just a subcontracting role. Um, another individual was part-time in a, in a different capacity. And then the third was also just coming off of a maternity leave. Uh, and this decided maybe this is more of the area that I want to get into. Um, and I think going that subcontractor route really helped me out uh, in terms of figuring out what it is that I wanted in another individual. But the problem with subcontracting is that, you know, in my business, um, I'm creating policy manuals and I'm creating um, these fantastic performance review programs and really cool onboarding programs for new employees. And I'm handing it to a subcontractor <laughs> with the hopes that they're not going to take it and just give it away to somebody else. And so I thought, you know, in order to protect my business, I think it's time that I look at bringing on a team member. And on top of that, the dream always was to have this group of really strong, passionate women surrounding me. Because let's be honest, um, as a lot of people have learned working from home over the last six months, it's not all fun all the time. <laughs> it's really not. I mean, it sounds super glamorous, but after like four days, you're like, okay, enough with this shit. <laughs> yeah, like I start talking to my office cat, you know, he becomes the coworker and, and, you know, once COVID hit my new coworkers who, you know, screamed for snacks all the time and, uh, and wanted, you know, mommy to play with them, they were not very good team members. So I really wanted a group of women that I could rely on, that I could call up and really kind of bounce things off of. So that's where we decided um, to start with, with hiring team members instead uh, on staff, on salary, and in a part-time capacity. Because what that also allowed me to do was to safeguard my business. So it allowed me to have intellectual property that I wasn't giving away to a subcontractor who may or may not have the same priorities as I do. What allowed me to do was bring on passionate HR people who would also have a supplementary income in the way that if they brought in uh, new clients to me, I provide them with a commission because I didn't want them to just feel like, you know, this was just the Laura show. Uh, I wanted to be able to make them feel a part of the whole process and proud to bring in their own clients, especially because they are part-time, right? They could do side jobs, but I wanted them to feel really integrated into the essential HR brand. It makes sense, you know, and delegating and, and just bringing in people to help <laughs> first and foremost, like at the ground level, like people to help people that are, that are really good at one thing. And, um, and, earlier episode we talked about like you know bring people in that are good at things that you're not good at like yes you don't you don't want to like multiply yourself 10 times like then you're just gonna get a whole bunch of that done and you're still gonna have this giant gaping hole so you know whether it is a subcontractor or, or it is an employee and we're going to talk even more about that here shortly but just bringing in people that have skill sets that are different than yours that can alleviate some of that pain so that you can take some of those hours back yeah. Like I know for myself, I love starting a project. I love the framework. I love the, the, you know, everything that goes into that first 25%. 
And I struggle with the last 25%. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. And, you know, my one team member, she is fantastic at finishing projects. Ah. Like, edits it to no tomorrow and makes sure it looks fantastic before it, it gets sent out. Um, so it, like in that sense, you've got to kind of know who you are and what you're looking for when you bring on that individual. Truth. I, I love finishers. <laughs> I love them so much. They are my heroes because I I am with you. I can start things all day long, but yes, so rounding true. that bend is not always the easiest thing. I think too, something that popped up is you were talking about the, that fear that kept popping up. And I think it's the fear of success, right? Like I know that, that sounds ridiculous to some yeah. people. Like why in the hell would you be afraid of succeeding? It's like, it's not the success I'm afraid of. It's the responsibility that comes along with it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think it also has to do with just, let's be honest, we're new at this. You know, I may have hired people before, but I've, you know, starting your own businesses is new. And I think you've said in a previous podcast, um, or maybe it was one of your guests, uh, that that fear feeling is the same as um, like taking a risk and that joy and that excitement of taking that risk. Those two things are very intermixed. So stepping out on that ledge, you might be fearful of it, but it's also that joy and excitement of that next big step. Absolutely. And the emotions can be tied together and you don't know which one is which. Yeah, that goes back to my analogy of bricks and butterflies. Like where are you feeling that fear in your body? Yeah. So if it's like really heavy and low in your gut and deep and it just feels it just feels heavy, that's what I would call bricks. And that is the fear that you want to stop, turn around and walk the other way. Mm -hmm. But if you're feeling kind of a fluttery light, you know, kind of up in your chest or upper stomach area and it's, you know, you kind of feel like you want to puke, <laughs> but you also feel kind of excited. Like those are butterflies and that's the good fear. That's the like, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm really freaking excited. <laughs> yeah. Like when you make that decision and all of a sudden that weight lifts and you yes. know, all right, this was the, the right decision. Why can't I, we make it three weeks ago? I did it. Yeah. Why did I sit <laughs> on that for three weeks? The stories so, I played in my head at night. Oh my gosh, we could have a whole series on the stories we tell ourselves at nighttime. <laughs> so tell me, what what is an HR company and why does a small business need one? That's a great question. And it's one I get a lot. So what essential HR does is we come in in the same manner that is if you were to hire a full-time HR manager or HR coordinator to do, um, you know, your policies, your protocols, your procedures, help you with hiring, helping you build the culture of the organization as to how you want to present it. Uh, you know, some HR people run payroll, they do health and safety, they do performance management and uh, employee relations. So helping managers through those sticky HR situations and conversations. So we work in the same manner as if somebody were, was an in-house HR manager. We just do it for small businesses. So I primarily say five to 50, though we have one client who um, they were starting their business. It was two partners and they brought us on because they said, we want to start it right. So we plan to grow to 10 by the end of the year. So let's get everything in place to make sure that people know who we are. And, and, and that way, when we're at 10 people, we're not backtracking. Ah, don't you love those kind of people? <laughs> the planners. Oh, they were so fantastic to work with too. Because they really knew their own brand. They had established their own brand and understood who they were as a company. And we got to come in and create this employer brand for them. So this is who you are to your clients, but who do you want to be to your employees? And how do you want them to see you? How do you want the outside world to see you as an employer? Like you think about, you know, Target or Apple as a brand, and they're very strong as a brand. They're very recognizable. Uh, people have strong opinions about them. But when you flip that, you think, what, is, what do I think about Target as an employer? Or what do I think about Apple or McDonald's as an employer? What first thoughts come to my brain? That's your employer brand. And that's what you really want to mold all through your business scaling and, and growing in order to know who you are as an employer and order for other people to know who you are as an employer when they're coming in. 
it's again kind of one of those things where when you say it out loud, it's like, oh, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> but if it's not, you know, especially when people are starting a business, there's so many things to think about. Mm-hmm. It's like, where do you even start? So even just planting the seed that, you know, building, you know, it's essentially building a culture, right? Internally, yeah. like what, you know, what do you, what do you stand for? What are your core values? Like, you know, how do we treat one another and, and all those things. When you build a team, it's like building a family. Like you spend more time, oftentimes, more times <laughs> with the people that you work with than you see the people at home. So yeah, I love the concept of creating the employer brand. Um, and I can see how that, that really contributes to the bigger picture. Well, do you remember in your teenage days when you applied for a job and granted a lot of things are online now, but you would walk in and you got a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Oh my gosh. Yes. I know exactly what you're talking about. (laughs) And so here you have, you know, let's think of Apple, for example. And if you walked into Apple and they gave you a photocopy of a photocopy or the way that they treated you when you walked in, or if the interview process was disjointed and they forgot about you, all of that plays into who who you think they are as an employer. And maybe it was like just a bad one-off, you know, they were having a bad week or whatnot, but all of that in your mind is going to settle into the crevices and they're going to say, well, subconsciously even, if this is who they are in the interview process, who are they going to be when I work for them? So I'll give you an example. I had a client actually um, a couple of weeks ago and they sent an email and they were competing for a, a fresh out of college graduate. And they offered her the job and she said, listen, I have another interview on Monday. I apologize, but I really want to take it just to make sure, you know, I'm confident in my decision. And, uh, and so this client was like, oh crap, I really want this girl. And we said, just let it be. Monday afternoon, she's like, you know what? I took that interview. If anything, it has proven to me the value that you bring and I, how much I appreciate those conversations. And all of that is part of your employer brand. How she presented her interview, how she presented herself, how she presented her offer, all built the confidence of this young lady to say, nope, I'm going to take A over B because that experience made me want more. Yeah, it helps to attract the right, the right people, right? And so as an HR company, you're helping people to build that employer brand and those processes and everything. Because I think sometimes people are like, oh my gosh, that's a whole other thing that I have to think of. I don't even know where to begin. But yeah. but working with someone like you is basically delegating and bringing you in to help create that process. Is that correct? Absolutely. And this, this, this company that I'm talking about, they have 12 people. So they're not a large organization. They're competing with larger organizations for top talent. But yeah, you know, we all have our kind of zone of genius and uh, I'm a big HR geek. So (laughs) when I make an employee policy manual and we hand it over, like that is a thing of pride to me. And somebody looks at it and says, thank God you did that and I didn't have to. And I look through that and it's, it makes me happy, (laughs) which is, you know, I guess it means you're in the right career when you're reading policies and they make you happy. You know, God love you. (laughs) Cause... But yeah, so what may seem overwhelming to somebody who this isn't their every day, which, you know, it shouldn't be. You started your business because you were good at A, B, and C, and I started mine because I'm good at D, E, and F. But when you really break it down, there's really in the interview and hiring process, four key areas that you want to look at when you're bringing on a team member. And the first is the job description. So the job description is really going to give you the nuts and bolts, the tiny minutia of everything you want this individual to do. You probably also want to talk about in that job description um, what they might be up against in an environmental standpoint. So are you working within a warehouse where there might be chemicals or allergens? Are you working in an office environment? Is there sitting all day, standing all day? Are there physical capacities that you need this individual to do? You really want to outline all of those within your job description. But then the second part is equally, if not more important. And sometimes people get confused between a job description and a job posting. Job description is your minutia. This is your A B A to Z. Your job posting is your advertisement. And your advertisement is what's going to bring people into your company. So you don't want your job posting to be the A to Z of everything this person's going to do. You want it to be kind of like the dating profile, just enough to want to make them apply, to want to learn more about you. 
That makes a lot of sense. You know, I think the job description is so important and I'm going to, I'm going to fold in some branding here too. Don't use the canned standard, whatever from the internet, like use your brand tone, use your brand personality. Like yes, it's, it's such a first step for people to get to know who you are. Like, I can't tell you how many times in the past when I had a team, when we were hiring, people would be like, I simply want to apply because of the job description, like the way that you wrote it. Like, it just seems like a great place to be. It seems like a fun work environment. Like you're really setting the tone. So if you have, a, you know, a relaxed, fun atmosphere, using something that's very canned and dry is, it's a brand disconnect from the get-go. And in the opposite, if you have a very formal atmosphere using, you know, something that's really easygoing and relaxed, you're going to show up you know, with an employee who wants to wear ripped jeans and a tank top and your clients are suit and tie. Yes. So matching who you are as a brand um, from a company standpoint to your internal documents is huge. One of my favorite things to do with job postings and, and attracting the right people to your role, and I'm sure you've seen this done well and you've seen it not done well, is your social media and lives, Instagram lives, Facebook lives, letting them into who you are as an employer, who you are as a supervisor, a manager, and directly relating that to your brand. Because the people who are watching your social, I mean, they already love you. So now you're going right after the people who love you and saying, well, look at this awesome opportunity we have within our workplace. It's your, I would say, best way to get the best quality candidate for who you're looking for, for your brand. I couldn't agree more. You know, there's a lot of really great, you know, websites out there that serve a really great purpose, but I, I have found that you get flooded, flooded with so many applications for people that just are not aligned. Whereas when you tie in that personal touch and you use your social media and like said, you already have these, these people and followers that are, that are with you for a reason. And now it's like, oh, now I have an opportunity to actually work there. Okay. Now you definitely have my attention. I mean, I've seen like designers that I follow, like interior designers who have post jobs. I'm like, I want to be an interior designer. <laughs> I don't want me as your interior designer, but it's like, I want to work there. That's so cool. Absolutely. So that was the first one. Take me down, take me down the rest of the list. What, yes. what are the other three key factors here? Number one, job description. First thing you need to do before you start hiring. Number two, turn it into a job posting. Number three is your interview guide. So, <laughs> I mean, have you ever been in one of those interviews and they like, I had one interview that the VP asked me, give me your top 10 strengths. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I got to like four or five and I was like pulling like random adjectives out of the air because I was just like, this, this is crazy. Like, or, you know, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? Maybe oh they have a purpose. <laughs> I haven't figured those questions out for their purpose, but your interview guide is going to be the thing that A, helps you find out of all the candidates, the one that's best suited for you and B, keeps you out of legal hot water. So wow. there's a lot of people who really like to just kind of free, you know, go with the interview very freely, you know, conversational. And that is fantastic for part of the interview, in my opinion. The problem with it is, is you're not asking the same questions to the same people, to all of the different candidates. So you know, person A gets these three questions, person B gets the next three, person C gets these four. And it leaves you kind of in the middle of not being able to adequately assess across the board. The other thing that can kind of get you into hot water if you're not following an interview guide is, you know, asking something that maybe you're not allowed to ask that can get you into hot water. I know like, you know, family status, for example, like, oh, so you have kids. Or how many kids do you have? Do you plan on getting pregnant again? You know, if you have that interview guide, it keeps you a little bit more on target and away from those sticky situations. So what you want to do with your interview guide is you want to link it back to your job description. So what did you ask for in that job description? What do you need the candidate to do? And how do you ask questions to find out um, about that specific skill or that specific task? So for example, if your culture, if your people within your organization, your small group, if they're very, you know, candor, like everybody just feels like they kind of say, give their opinion. At the end of the day, you're all kind of on board with the same thing, but everybody has an opinion. Everybody gives their opinion. If that's your culture, 
you might want to ask a question such as, you know, tell me about a time where you had to bring um, your opinion forward, but at the end of the day, you, they decided to go in a different direction. And how did you handle that? Because if that's already part of your culture, you want to know if someone has come up against that and what they did about it. You don't necessarily want to ask them what they would do, because I mean, we can all give you, you know, the A plus answer. We want them to dig into the, you know, folds of their brain to find out what did they do. And that way, you know, they've had that experience. That's a great suggestion. Already just, again, it's infusing your your employer brand into the process. Like every step of the way, they're getting a piece of who you are. The other reason I like interview guides is actually a very um, personal story from our business. Uh, so the first person I ever interviewed to bring on uh, as a subcontractor who I gave a lot of, a lot of work to, she was a fantastic interview um, and a fantastic individual. But what happened is I connected with her on a personal level So much so that the interview guide went out the window. And this is where people say, oh, you got to use your gut. You got to use your intuition. And we had a great conversation. I think we spoke on the phone for like 45 minutes to an hour. And I just knew that she was the right person. Three months in, actually not even that long, two months in, um, she was supposed to be doing some work for me. And we came to realize that she actually didn't know how to do the work. That wow. she had been around people who had done that work, but never really did it herself. And I, I you know, it's a little bit embarrassing because I'm the HR person who threw out the interview guide and made a bad decision. Um, but my gut told me, this girl's awesome. And she is. She is awesome. But she wasn't right for this role. I think that brings up a really, really important point in that is the personal relationship versus the employer relationship like that, especially as a small business. And I don't want to forget about number four. So we'll definitely come back to that. So I'm going to bookie or that, but what is your experience on that or what suggestions or guidance do you have? Because especially as a small business, it is so easy to get personally invested in your people and then things go haywire. Yeah. (laughs) That's <laughs> yeah. Let's be honest. Our first hires when we start a business are most often friends and family members. Yes. Because we trust them. We expect that they have a loyalty to us like we do to them. Um, they have a loyalty to our business. And, and a lot of times it works out. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. So I think you just have to know who you are as a manager, which is tough if you've never managed before. Like how comfortable are you with those difficult conversations? So maybe just playing out scenarios in your head. If I had to tell cousin Karen that her customer service skills sucked for last, lack of a better term, how would I go about doing it? And would I be able to have that conversation? And I think if you play out those scenarios to try to figure out, can I manage my personal situations um, separately from my work situations? Uh, at the end of the day, there is a good percentage of those personal situations that no longer work out after they've become business relationships. And I guess you just got to make the decision that if this goes south, am I okay with that? Like if this friendship goes south because of a business situation, am I okay with that? Or if my business goes south because of a friendship situation, am I okay with that? Yeah, it's it's kind of to each their own and everyone has different levels of it. And I, I admire some people are super good at, you know, like not having really any, you know, outside personal relationship with their employees. Um, I know as an employer previous, like that, that was always a struggle for me. Like I just, like, like you just said with your example, if, you know, hiring the wrong person because you have the gut check and everything feels good and everything's puppy dogs and rainbows and oh my God, I'm so excited. And then you realize I got into my heart and not, and out of my head. Yeah. And I think, I don't think it's, you know, when, when you're not the manager or the supervisor, you know, those relationships are very easy um, because you're just co- colleagues. But when it's your business, I think you really have to take a hard look at who you want to be as an employer. So do you want to be barking orders or do you want a cohesive, you know, not micromanaging type of, of, of workplace? Like who are you, as an individual, can you give a task list without somebody taking offense to it? 
Or do you tend to have a more domineering personality, which is not a bad thing to each their own. Um, But knowing who you are is going to help you know whether you can have those personal relationships. And for the record, I love having personal relationships with the people I work with. I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's great to come to work to a job you love. And it's even better to come to work to a job you love with people you love. True. So I get that not everybody's going to be best friends, but being able to work together in, in a great manner certainly makes for a better work workplace. It sure does. All right. So let's bring back around. We've got number four kind of flapping out here in the wind. So let's, let's pull mm-hmm. her in. Offer letter. Offer so letter. Handshake is not going to help you. We are so beyond the place of, you know, a verbal offer and a handshake and calling it a day. That's all great at the beginning. But what happens is at the end of the relationship, for whatever reason that there's an end, it gets sticky. And you, despite whether you're one, um, whether you're 100 employees or whether you're five or 10, you are the big bad employer. And unless you have that offer letter that's outlining how the relationship is going to start, what's going to happen in the relationship and how, if it needs to end, these are the parameters, you can be in a really, really hot water. And by hot water, I mean money. Um, You could be stuck with a lot of payout if you have to terminate somebody and you don't have a termination clause by which to go by. So for example, uh, if your termination clause says that you will give out two weeks of termination pay for every year of service up to 10 weeks, then that's how you abide by everyone signed off on it and it's copacetic. But if you don't have that, now you're really getting into hot water in terms of what are the minimum standards and will if this person takes me to court, will I know um, that the minimum standards will be upheld or will they get more and will I be paying one month per year of service? All of that, all of the strain, all of the emotional turmoil of ends of contracts and ends of employment can be solved with a really solid offer letter. It saves so much time and so much energy and it just eliminates the majority of the issues right yes. up front. Yeah. And so if your offer letter is less is is less than two pages, it's probably not enough. <laughs> it's probably not establishing enough of the parameters that you want. And offer letters are sticky. I mean, Contract law is changing every month, it feels like. Maybe it's every year, but every month. One or two words can really put you into a bind. So having a solid offer letter that you have confidence in um, is, I would say, probably one of the most important things in your business. Well, and I feel like a lot of times people are like, well, I don't want to just go into this relationship assuming that, you know, someone's going to screw somebody over. But honestly, you... (laughs) You have to plan for that because, I mean, it's the truth, right? Like people have great intentions until they don't. And when things go south, it's usually hard and fast. And if if that stuff is not, you know, if your I's aren't dotted and your T's aren't crossed and, you know, your sentences don't have periods on them, um, there's, if there's any level of gray area, unhappy people will find the gray area. Mm Mm-hmm. And so as an employer, it's really your responsibility to protect the company first. Absolutely. Yeah. And the emotional turmoil that goes over any time somebody is attempting to sue your business is so vast. Like, it breaks my heart when I see, you know, these great employers who have this one small bad experience with an individual, and it just eats them up. 90% of their emotions go towards it. 90% of their work week goes towards it. And it's so easy to avoid because let's be honest, most people get an offer letter in a, in most situations, at least they should. This is not a new thing for an employee to come into your organization and have to sign uh, an offer letter of employment is not a new thing. I don't think anybody would be taken aback by it. Um, And there is ways to make that offer feel personal. There's ways to make sure that everything surrounding that offer feels personal. So making sure your communication around interviews, making sure your communication around when they come on board and that orientation, all of that is very personal and can be very soft. 
And that will all help that offer letter feel less contracty. Right. And again, brand tone, just talk like your business. hundred <laughs> percent. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be again, some like super sterile, like, and this, you will abide by that. You know, like it, that's, that's not the point of this. The point of this is to set everyone's expectations on the same level and get everything in place before you start employment. Because once emotions get involved, mm-hmm. that, it gets real hairy real quick. Absolutely. So those are the four, I would say, job descriptions, job postings, your interview guide, and your offer letter. That is the four keys to hiring right the first time. Mm, hiring right the first time because let's face it hiring is expensive (laughs) you know it's not just the time and effort in creating all these documents like you've talked about in in establishing this process but you know the one of the worst things in the world is to you know get two or three weeks into training this person to realize they're not the right fit yes or two or three years or or that (laughs) yeah absolutely so We've got this magic human. They've they've gone through this whole process, the hiring, they're the right fit. What about like the onboarding process? Because I think that that is um, something that's really important as far as like folding them into your culture and getting them trained and all that. Like, what are some areas that you see employers um, getting a little bit stuck and what are some things that you recommend? Okay, so if you can see my face right now, I have this big goofy grin on like onboarding, onboarding. <laughs> onboarding. Um, <laughs> this is the next best thing we could talk about. I love onboarding. So absolutely. And we have all had the experience where you show up to your first day of the new job and they're all, you know, maybe happy to see you. Maybe they're prepared for you. And you get through the morning of your orientation. You meet a, f- a few cool people. You have lunch. And then half an hour after lunch, you're sitting at your desk, staring at the wall, wondering how you're going to pass the next two and a half hours. <laughs> and yeah. It's relatable because so many of us have had it, whether it's an office environment or whether, you know, we're on the floor of a retail store and you're just kind of staring at somebody working a cash register because that's what your onboarding process is. So finding what you want for that onboarding process is super important. So day one, and again, your whole relationship actually starts back in the interview stage. So day one should be a continuation of who you are as an employer. So you want to know what day one looks like. You want them to meet key people. You want their coworkers to take them out for lunch, possibly. You want them to feel welcome in that environment and you want it to be busy. So I don't think on day one that you could make somebody feel too busy. Like we all want to be productive, right? There are not many of us who want to say like, can I please, well, maybe I do. Can I please read the policy manual for the next two days? (laughs) We all want to feel like we're contributing as quick as possible. And frankly, it's the benefit of the employer to get this person trained as quick as possible so that they are contributing as quick as possible. And without pulling random stats out of the air, there's a direct correlation to how long and how much engagement an employee has compared to what their onboarding process looked like. So if they were kind of left to their own devices, they may be a great employee and they may come around but their efficiency is going to be tanked for the first three months. So finding out what it is we need on day one, what do we need to happen in week one? And what do we need to happen in month one? I love having programs like a a documents, um, things that explain what this looks like and aligning it to your brand standards, man, that just speaks volumes. So they come on board, they know who you are, they now see everything is aligned and followed through in all of your documents. That just ups their engagement, whether consciously or subconsciously, saying, you know what, I made the right choice and and I'm really excited about this role. What happens when they sit and stare and not don't know what they're doing for the first three days? It kind of eats away at you. You feel less involved. You feel like you're not contributing and they're going to say, well, it's been two weeks and I haven't even done anything yet. And are they just going to fire me because they don't know my capacity or my potential? So figuring out how to bring in that employer brand all through that onboarding system is fantastic. What I like with onboarding as well is, you know, some people do a 30, 60, 90 day kind of feedback session. 
And that's fantastic. I would never discount anybody for doing a 30, 60, 90 day. But let's be honest, employers are busy. And if you promise a 30, 60, and 90, you better get it done (laughs) because that's going to speak to your integrity as an employer. So make it easy on yourself. So make sure that your milestones, so maybe you have a one week touch base and then you have a 90 day formal touch base as opposed to promising that we'll oh, we'll meet every Friday afternoon and, and go over and after two weeks that never happens again. So build that onboarding and build that orientation to who you are and what you can actually handle. And once you got that down, you can bolster it. You can make it even, you know, more robust, but start with the basics. Again, systemized, right? Like once you build this once, you just do it over and over again, right? You, you don't, you're not reinventing the wheel. I think one of the, one of the things that you said that really stood out is like, employers are busy. We're busy people. We have, a, we're hiring people because we need help. Um, yeah. And I think that that, you know, can kind of go against employers sometimes because let me just get this person in here quick and kind of throw them in, throw them in the yeah. fire everyone else will teach them. And then it's kind of on everyone else to be like, well, I do it like this. And then someone else says, well, I do it like that. And then you end up with this really kind of piecemealed version of, you know, the, the output of your business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you weren't busy, you wouldn't need an extra person, right? Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So keeping it simple and keeping your you know, aligning the expectations of the employee with what your schedule is and what you can promise and sticking with it, I think is, is the most important. So if you say we're going to have a weekly touch base, it's a weekly touch base. If you're going to say it's a monthly, it's a monthly. If you say, Hey, Jane is your new best friend. Talk to Jane with anything. Cool. But you've assigned that responsibility now. And it's still your responsibility to make sure Jane is doing her job in, uh, in bringing your new employee along. You know, managing people really you know, it's a lot more grand than I think people really understand. Like it's managing expectations and responsibilities and, you know, really setting the foundation because without their, without your direction, they're, they're kind of floundering, right? Like they're everyone, again, everyone ends up kind of doing it in their own, in their own form and fashion. People think managing is easy. Managing people is the most difficult thing you will ever do in your life, hands down. I'm certain of it because you are invested in these people. You do care about them. And when, you know, when emotions aren't aligned, when you feel that they've offended you in some way or disrespected you, or they feel that you've disrespected them, like that's what keeps people up at night, right? Like that's what worries us. And and we want to be great employers and we want to be great businesses to work for. Um, And when things go off, it feels like, what have I been building this whole time? So I would always tell people like, give yourself a little bit of grace um, because managing people is not easy. It really is not. I mean, it's, it's definitely not for the faint of heart. And, you know, I don't care what anybody says. It is personal <laughs> because <laughs> before you're an employer, before you're an employee, you're a human being yep. and human beings have emotions and feelings. So like a company like yours or an HR team, is is this like kind of that middle ground that you were talking about though? Like, you know, so if direct employer, um, maybe there isn't a manager, maybe the employer is the, you know, kind of the, the go-to person. Does the, does the team like yours step in kind of as the center point to, you know, have those difficult conversations or like what are the benefits of bringing on an HR team like yours? Yeah, so we have you know, our, we have what we call partnership. It's most, I guess, easily known as a retainer. It starts at five hours a month and it's for these kind of things a hundred percent. So a lot of times, especially when you're um, managing a business and you have no other really people at the same level or colleagues, a lot of those emotions, you don't have anybody to talk to about them. Like, how am I going to work out this conversation? Uh, or what do I do about A, B, and C? And you don't have somebody to rely on to help you walk through that. That's why we have these partnerships. So, I mean, it's a phone call. Let's figure out What's going on? What are the next steps? What do we anticipate might happen if we do A, B, or C? What do we anticipate happens if we say D, E, or F? And that's all under the umbrella of employer relations and those management conversations. So yeah, that's 100% what we do. Um, And it's funny because sometimes I have some of our clients come to us with problems. They're like, I know you've never heard this before. Nope. 
You're like, you (laughs) would be surprised. (laughs) Hold my beer. (laughs) You do. You need somebody to bounce that off of because half the time you just need to say it out loud in order to come to, you know, what you want to do. And you need someone behind you to say, yeah, that's the right decision. Go forward with that in order to have confidence in what you're doing. What about, could you help debunk? Because I would bet a lot of, and, and I was in this boat and honestly, I had never had an HR team and this is just bringing so much to light, but I would bet that there's a lot of people that think I can't afford HR. Like that's just not a thing for me. I don't, I'm not a big enough company to bring on Mm -hmm. HR. I don't have enough funds to bring on HR. I don't have enough people to bring on HR. Like that's not really for me. Yeah. And I mean, you might not even be at a size where you would give somebody 40 hours a week to find work to do um, because it's just it's a small business. And that's why you look for companies such as ours that offer flexible op- options. So like I said, we start working with businesses at five hours a month, five hours a month. Um, it's a very small commitment, but it just gives the confidence that somebody might need in order to know who to call to make sure that they're A, legally protected, B, maybe they need the emotional support, um, or C, just what path do I take here? So that's what I would suggest. Uh, There's other opportunities that you have. um, And I mean, if we had all the time in the world, I'm sure business owners would go for multiple HR trainings. Uh, But oftentimes a lot of like chamber associations might have um, lunch and learns on HR topics about performance management or handling different difficult conversations. I mean, I've loved your podcast for some of those types of conversations that are uh, learnings as well. So definitely if you can find somebody who has the legal background, that's obviously the the best, but there is opportunities. Even some accounting firms sometimes do just different types of lunch and learn trainings that and eat, eat those things up because there's always new things to learn in best practices. That is a true story. What about, you know, let's say I'm a small business and I need some help, but I'm just not, I'm not ready to commit to, to bringing on employees you know, that's a bit more to bite off than I can chew right now. So I want to bring on subcontractors. Mm -hmm. What are some important things that small businesses should keep in mind or look out for or supply when bringing on subcontractors? So our four documents, job descriptions, job postings, interview guide, and offer letter, I'd say still stand. So your job description is still your job description for what you need out of a subcontractor. Your interview guide, when you're hiring a subcontractor, you still need to know they can do what they that you, what you need them to do and what they say they can do. And that offer letter, it's going to look different. It's going to be a subcontractor agreement, but it's still just as important as your employment offer letter for a team member because you still want to know that A, that they realize that they're a subcontractor and B, all the parameters are in place. So for example... Subcontractors often supply or often need to supply their own resources. So whether it's computers and laptops or or cell phones, um, subcontractors often are required to set their own hours. So depending on your state or province, there's going to be parameters by which you can hire a subcontractor. Some states and provinces don't allow subcontractors um, to be considered an employee by means of the employer cannot determine what hours they work. So I can't have Jane come in Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays from 10 to 3 because as a subcontractor, they need to be able to set their own hours um, and set the parameters by which they do the work. So that's something to really consider. Uh, From an employment standpoint, you really want to make the lines clear between the subcontractor and the employees. uh, Because that can get you into legal hot water if that becomes unclear. You could be you know, sacked with the subcontractor's vacation and their um, holiday pay if they are indeed considered by law an employee and not necessarily a subcontractor. So that subcontractor's offer letter in that contract is going to be vital in that relationship as well. See, you just make it so simple. <laughs> you really do. And that's that's the power of, of, of what you do, right? Is... Um, you know, you can follow these same steps. It's just the, you know, how they're viewed and what their relationship is like is different. So going through those same four steps. Um, and I love even coming down to the offer letter. Like that just, it just states the facts and it makes things very crystal clear. And if it's not clear, that's a time to clean it up. 
Absolutely. So for example, your subcontractor agreement letter might state that they can't do any work outside of your organization for the company that they're doing work for. So, you know, if it's, if it's a graphics and design firm, they can't go after the individuals who you subcontracted work to or solicit them in any way. So you want to make sure that those things are outlined. You want to make sure intellectual property is outlined. So if I give you A, B, and C, you can't take it and go sell it to, um, you know, Bob Smith down the street. So all of those things, you got to protect your business. You have to protect home base first and foremost. Like that, that has to be your priority because if you're not willing or able to protect home base, it just, it's like leaving cracks open in the windows for shit to seep in. Like, and you just don't want shit seeping in. <laughs> well, if anybody box at this, like if you present this to somebody and they balk at, you know what, they're not for you. If, if, if you can't legally protect your business um, and somebody isn't able, isn't willing to, you know, agree to that, they're not for you. Period. End of story. Okay. Move on. Right? Like that's okay. It is okay. I would, I would rather you do all this legwork and get up to the point of that offer letter or, you know, signing on the dotted line of this contract and things go, Hey, why are there? Then get them in. And that's when it gets like really gross, right? Like that's when it gets really sticky. So it's fine. Like cut bait and get out. And that's okay. You might've just saved yourself a giant headache. <laughs> giant headache. What are, what are some other sticky employee situations that you see um, small businesses running up against just so people can kind of like condition their mind for, for things to look out for and some preventative measures? Hmm. All right. So let's talk. I mean, we can talk COVID. You want to talk COVID? I mean, it's pretty damn relevant. (laughs) So I think about weekly, I get a call from uh, one of our our clients saying, so what do I do about Jane, whose uncle's roommate's girlfriend has oh. COVID? <laughs> Can they come in? Can they? It's, it's one of those things that we literally have to rely on public health and we have to rely on good sense. So one situation where that happened um, it was a, a electrical company and it was so far removed. The case was so far removed that I said, you know what, your, your risk is very, very low if, if at, all, at all. But this person is going into individual, your client's houses. Uh-huh. And if they were to say, oh yeah, my uncle's girlfriend's roommate <laughs> has it. What, what kind of PR would that provide? Is there anything we can get this guy to do in the next three days till that 14 days is over since he saw his uncle that uh, that would not present itself as a P- potential PR nightmare. Um, so really thinking through both sides of it, what is the client side? What is your business side? What, you know, we got to run a business at the end of the day and what is the employee's safety, safety side of it and weighing all three of those options. The other big one that's coming up right now too is childcare, right? So a lot of A, schools aren't opening. Um, and if schools are opening in different parts of the country, um, some people are electing to stay home. And what is the employer's obligations around and allowing somebody to work from home or continue on a leave of absence? So I would say when it comes to childcare obligations, you really have to A, look at what are the human rights concerns within the state, um, the state law? So is it a protected uh, grounds, that family status? And if so, how does that interact with your specific situation? Because the first thing you want to do is make sure you're not crossing any human rights law, like issues. <laughs> the second thing you want to do is who are you going to be as an employer? Because that's going to take a stand Um, in terms of what decisions you make as well. So not every employer can allow people to just determine that they're going to be on a leave of absence for an undisclosed amount of time or work from home at an undisclosed amount of time. We all wish we could, but not every employer has that capacity. Some have, you know, requirements of being in person. Like there's only, that's only way they can run their business. Um, So you really have to determine the human rights standpoint from a family status uh, to A, even get a baseline of what your obligations are and then work from there as to determine how you can accommodate 
um, if you can accommodate and how that's all going to play out. This is why you should just hire Laura. (laughs) Because for you as the listener, as the employer today, to remember, understand, and retain all of those different laws and situations is going to make your head explode. Like, it's just, it's not your lane. You need to be educated and understand, but it's not your thing to do. Like, so just hire Laura, just go to her website in the show notes and she's going to help you out with all this shit. <laughs> yeah. And you nice to have somebody to call, right? It, that's the thing. Like, and you were saying that earlier, somebody to just bounce things off of in your, um, in your submission form, I'm just going to kind of go down a couple of these things. Um, some examples like um, questionable employee clothing and loud or <laughs> offensive coworkers or smells or odors in the office and privacy concerns on social media accounts, like all of these things, like when you are in charge of people, what, what opens up is just sometimes mind blowing. (laughs) Yeah. If someone's keeping something smelly in their locker beside another person who dislikes it, you know, seen it all. (laughs) (laughs) Like what, like, what do you do? Like, and how do you not offend somebody or get, get yourself sued? Like it just, you have to really, I mean, you have to think about that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think it's important to really to really pause and think about your, your business plan and your business goals. And, you know, there are a a ton of upsides to having employees, you know, having the right employees in the right seat on the bus can be magic for your business, but you have to be ready. You have Mm -hmm. to be ready for that. You have to um, be prepared to really go all in. Yeah. A hundred percent. As I start to kind of round us out here, what are maybe some of the top things that you want people to look out for when hiring, whether it's a subcontractor or an employee or, and even managing people, like what are just some key things that every business should, should know and do? I would say when you're in that interview process, when you feel that gut check, um, and we talked about, you know, the gut check where I thought it was all good. When you feel that gut check, like there's something here and I can't put my finger on it. Um, dig. You know, there's no harm in in digging a little. Like if somebody's evading a question or not answering, or you see them kind of go off in la-la land, you have the ability to ask further questions. If you feel that little gut chat, that little red flag, it's probably there for a reason. And make sure you flush it out so that you either know that, yes, you know what, this is an okay answer, or no, there's something here and I need to, I, I need to maybe pass on this individual. Um, I would say that's the most important is don't let those little red flags just die in the sand. Make sure that you pick them up and, and, and run with them to make sure you're maybe not missing out on a great candidate or maybe passing on a not so great one. But I would say in terms of the recruitment process, that would be my kind of pro tip for the afternoon. Um, in general, I think it's really important to kind of determine in your head what people have you loved working for. And what were their attributes? How did they make you feel? What did they do that made you feel that way? And how do you want to acclimatize those into who you are as a manager and an an employer? And equally as important, you know, who are the people that you didn't like working for? And how can you avoid being that individual? Um, It can be as simple as, you know, I had a supervisor who never small talked. And I'm a person who once a week, it would be great if you called me up and say, hey, how's it going? Not to talk about work, but just, you know, about life in general. Um, And I thought to myself, if I ever become in that position, I want to make sure that people know that you can pick up the phone to talk about nothing. Like I want to make sure that that line of communication is open. So knowing who you want to be as an employer and how you want to present um, and how you want to manage is very important, I think, in determining even the type of employees that you hire. Great advice. So much great advice today. This is such a valuable, like, in-depth conversation. So I I so appreciate your your time and what you do in this world. I'm curious, what what does gutsy mean to you? I think gutsy is different for everybody. Like, maybe gutsy for a person with anxiety and depression means that they just got out the door that day. For me, I think it's facing the fear and doing it anyways, you know, having those conversations that give you those butterflies and making those decisions that give you butterflies. That's, that to me is gutsy. I like it. (laughs) Well, Laura, 
again, this has been just so enlightening and I want to make sure that everyone knows where they can find you. So how do we stay in touch with you? How do we connect with you? What's the best way to stay up to date with what you're doing? For sure. So I've actually made a little a download called Defining Your Employer Brand and the Five Steps to Get in There. Um, and it can be found at essentialhr.ca slash gutsy. So oh, I, I love it. Oh, I'm so excited. We, we have the link to this in the show notes as well, but you can go directly to that link. Yeah, so it's going to help you defining your goals and, and evaluating your environment and really defining that employer brand. And I think it will speak to a lot of what we, we talked about today. Fantastic. Well, thank you again so much for spending your time sharing your knowledge with us. This has been just an absolute pleasure to chat with you today. You as well. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Join me this Thursday as we take our power back by we're going to keep this train going in establishing what that employer brand is from the sense of what is your brand as in general? What are we putting out into the world? And also what are we putting out into our potential employees? In the meantime, head over to lauraora.com to learn about brand reviews, power back sessions, and check out the newly launched Brand Starter Micro Course. Join the conversation on social with me at that Laura Aura. And as always, until I see you next time, stay gutsy.